All right. One. One person has. Okay. Now, so we have one. So in your opinion, was he a good or a bad? Um, rather simplistic way of doing it, but uh, generally the general. Okay. Well, <laughs> no, 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 no. Actually, all of you were correct. There's a good reason that nobody knows anything about him. And the few who know enough about him to judge him, there were only two who, who said so in Wisconsin, and they both had a positive opinion of him. Ten years ago, if you'd asked me, I would have ranked him last of Lee's six lieutenant generals. Tonight, I'm going to tell you how some very celebrated historians misled me and how I came to discover the truth. As was mentioned, I was T. Harry Williams' last PhD candidate. And there were more than 40 who preceded me. And yet, more, let's see, uh, 30 years after his death, they had yet to put together an anthology in his honor. So in 2009, there were several of us having dinner at a convention in Louisville, Kentucky. We were known as the LSU Mafia, and we don't need to go into why. And being the junior member of the group, I suggested <laughs> that we do an anthology in Harry's honor. Now, as the alcohol flowed and we prepared to do battle the next day against Alabama, <laughs> surprisingly, the godfather of our group endorsed the project. And when the godfather says we'll do it, you know what everybody else says? Yeah, so we're going to do it. But Roger Spiller, who unfortunately passed away about quite a year ago, had two requirements. We're going to do it on Lee and his generals, because Harry did Lincoln and his generals. So we're going to you know, poke the old man in the grave. And if you do a book on Lee and his generals, it has to have an essay on Lee. Nobody offered to write the essay on Lee. And everybody left at the end of the evening thinking, Phew, you know, we dodged a bullet. Yep, we all endorsed it, but we're not going to have to do it because nobody's going to do Lee. Well, I happened to also go to school at the University of Kentucky and studied under Charlie Rowland. And through a very unusual set of circumstances, Charlie Rowland was T. Harry's first PhD. And I knew it. Charlie wouldn't admit it publicly, but I knew it. And Charlie wrote, as far as I'm concerned, the finest essay ever written on Robert E. Lee. Charlie was at the convention, and I called him at breakfast the next morning, and he agreed. So now the boys are stuck. Now, I've co-edited 10 anthologies now. Uh, page proofs are coming from my last one. Uh, it is tougher than hurting cats. Harry's boys performed far above the norm. They delivered their essays within 10 months. Some people don't get them done in five years. <laughs> truly, truly. Now, because they were so prompt, we managed to get the book published to coincide with a symposium uh, in uh, Hammond, Louisiana in 2012 on the weekend, June the 1st, that Lee took command, 150th anniversary of Lee taking command of the Army in Northern Virginia. Now, having it's oh, yep, there we go, okay. Having instigated the anthology, I graciously was the last to pick the general of my, that would be my subject. And I thought Anderson's the worst of Lee's Corps commanders. I can knock it out in three weeks, no problem. Got 10 months, but I can knock it out in three weeks. So six months later, I hadn't started. And I had arranged to interview Ed Bars. And many, many of you, some of you anyway, were there that night, at least passing by us as you were going to and from the bar. But we were at the uh, Country Club Resort that Ray booked us in. What, whatever, 2010. 2010. 2010, that's the place. So on the Friday night there, I had a, a set up to interview Ed about something else, and we finished early. So I said, I asked Ed, so how would you rank Lee's 
six lieutenant generals. And he went from last to first and gave details. Why? And when he listed Anderson fourth and not sixth, I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> so I got home from Virginia and went to work. Three months later, my opinion of Richard Anderson had changed dramatically. And instead of the 11,000 word maximum for my essay, I had 83,000 and had to finish a biography of him. Now, there were, Anderson has only been the subject of two biographies and somebody who won the one tonight, the last winner got that great rare book. Okay, that was the first one published in 1911. I didn't know that it had been reprinted. The second one was published by Morningside Bookstore in the 1980s. Both were, and it was about that size. There's another fellow who's been working on one for 20 some years and I've been working on mine since 2010 or 29 I guess you'd say, 10 years now. Two little old dated biographies. He's the least remembered of all these corps commanders. There's not a statue of him anywhere. He doesn't even get one like Longstreet at Gettysburg. He never wrote his memoirs. Anderson is truly an enigma. Now Richard Anderson was born in South Carolina October 7, 1821. His father was a physician who married very well and he soon ranked among the richest planters in South Carolina. Richard quickly learned about death. His older sister at the age of four died. Or when he was four, I'm sorry, let me rephrase it. When he was four, his older sister, and Richard was the second child, his older sister died. And Richard took her middle name as his own. That's where the heron comes from. His mother died when he was 10 and a younger brother when he was 11. His next door neighbor and childhood playmate was Mary Boykin Chestnut, the Confederate diarist. Literally lived within about 125 yards away when they were growing up. She was 17 months younger than Richard and later in life she deemed him, quote, the most silent and discreet of men. Now Richard's father and his five surviving children, including Richard, were all devout Christians. And when 16-year-old Richard went off to West Point, the father gave him the family Bible. And Richard would keep it with him for the rest of his life and read it frequently. Now at West Point, he finished his 40th out of 56 graduates in 1842. That doesn't, one of the things most, just readers and even, even historians forget, how many didn't finish? Now in the process, there were, it was almost 140, maybe more than that even. But of those who actually passed the, exam, the entrance exams and started, there were another 32 that didn't graduate. So he's 40th out of the 56 who graduated, but the 32 more who didn't. But I'm sorry, let me go back. By 1861, 19 of the graduates are dead. Some in the Mexican War, some fighting the Indians. One guy fell off a steamboat crossing the river. 18 of the 37 survivors will become generals in the Civil War. Some notable ones on both sides. Anderson's best friend for life will be Daniel Harvey Hill. Anderson was an excellent horseman. He's assigned to the Dragoons. He skipped over 10 other graduates to get the plum spot because of his abilities. He had a very distinctive career, but it was distinguished by sort of weird, unusual, unique episodes, often in the rear, not in the front. When the officers of the army organized the Aztec Club in Mexico City, a social group. Anderson didn't join. He wasn't a suck up. Anderson would rather do without travel reimbursements than fill out all the paperwork. 
even though it strained his finances. Anderson hated paperwork. He was wounded while leading troops in the only engagement, and I would wager none of you have ever heard of it, between U.S. Army forces and abolitionists in Bleeding Kansas. Only one engagement fought. He's in it. He's in command of the U.S. troops attacking the abolitionists, and he's wounded during the engagement. Sidney Johnson in the Utah expedition selected Anderson from hundreds of officers to command the escort of the orphans of the Mountain Meadows Massacre where the Mormons massacred the wagon train headed west. Anderson commands the group of soldiers who escorted them back east to be with their relatives. Anderson was among 25 officers who attempted to climb what they believed to be the highest peak in North America. They made it up 17,000 feet but had to turn back a thousand feet short of the sermon because of weather conditions. 19 of them including Ulysses S. Grant took off. They would had enough. But six of them including Anderson went back and planted the first American flag atop the volcano. Anderson never quit. Though strongly opinionated, Anderson was not confrontational. By 1850, his Bible study convinced him that slavery was wrong. Though he never vocally opposed it, his father understood his dilemma. And his father amended his will. If any of his heirs refused to inherit his slaves, they got nothing. Despite opposing slavery and being married to a Pennsylvania girl, the daughter of the state Supreme Court Chief Justice, Anderson believed in state rights, and you never see it published that way anymore, but it is state rights. But like other things, he did not voice his opinion about his position on state rights, and this worried South Carolinians. In 1859, the legislature presented him with a sword for his service during the Mexican War. And more than a decade later, they, you know, because they're worried about which way he's going to go when the war comes, 1859. And Anderson writes them a letter thanking them for the sword in which he really delineates the difference between the common country of the United States and his country, South Carolina. And it's a concept that if you don't study the Civil War, you, most people today would have no idea of, and certainly everybody who goes on about the, the monuments and everything else these days cannot appreciate it. But to the people in 1860, the state was their nation, not the United States. His wife's pregnancy delayed his resignation from the U.S. Army until February 15th, 1861. More than two months, or yeah, almost two months after South Carolina succeeded. But nevertheless, he managed to get to Charleston in time to serve as second in command to Beauregard when the Confederates opened fire on Fort Sumter. When Beauregard departed for Virginia, he left Anderson in command of Charleston. Now, Anderson was a different kind of Christian soldier than Stonewall Jackson. Anderson wasn't aggressive in spreading the word. He never claimed any credit for himself, but he never criticized anybody. He never, particularly his subordinates, who he also did not give credit to. Like Jackson, I'm sorry, let me, his behavior made him invisible to everybody, except when he, the enemy encountered him. Like Jackson, he was a fighter. And like Jackson, he never lied. Anderson was the highest ranking South Carolinian. Ooh, did I, something went wrong here on my program. Well, anyway, he's the highest ranking South Carolinian to resign from the old army. And Davis forgets about him. He's stuck down in Charleston, you know he's not at the front. 
And finally, South Carolina's politicians get together and, and tell the president that he's going to do something about it. So Davis promotes Anderson to Brigadier General on July the 19th, 1861. In August, he's transferred to Pensacola. And there he's severely wounded in October while leading a raid out on Santa Rosa Island. Braxton Bragg reported that Anderson had, quote, conducted the expedition with a zeal and gallantry worthy of high commendation. When Anderson recovered from that wound, he became Bragg's second in command. On January 1st, 1862, Bragg was over in Mobile and Anderson's in command and Anderson throws an open house party. He's drunk by one o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, smash. And then all of a sudden the Yankees open fire from Fort Pickens. <laughs> well, what do you do when you're drunk and you're in command and the enemy opens fire? Well, you run out and you jump on the parapet and you kind of make a spectacle of yourself. And they, the Confederates fired, they exchanged fire for some time. The Confederates couldn't do anything to Fort Pickens and in the process there's some, a couple of Confederate warehouses full of supplies get burned up. So Bragg gets back that night, finds out what happens, and has Anderson arrested on three charges, one of which was drunkenness. Anderson admitted that he was drunk, promised he would never do it again, and Bragg released him from quarters. He did not touch another drop of alcohol for the rest of the war. While he's awaiting his court-martial, he goes to visit President Davis in Richmond. And the President cuts him off. Tells him, I can suggest nothing but obedience. <coughs> now considering that Anderson's first cousin was married to Jefferson Davis's niece, as well as their previous association in the old army, Anderson must have been stunned that this is the first words out of the president's mouth to him. But he gave no indication of it. He politely thanked Davis for his time and excused himself. Davis was stunned. Davis, by now more of the politician than the soldier, was like, okay, I gave him, you know, his opening, he was supposed to come back with his argument about his case and everything. And instead, Anderson you know, said, excuse me, and left. Davis didn't sleep that night. And he gets up the next morning and he tells his wife that the encounter with Anderson had really upset him. Mysteriously, the charges against Anderson disappear. There's no paper trail. Boy, it's not like today. There's absolutely no paper trail. And even more importantly than that, we're talking about charges filed by Braxton Bragg. <laughs> Davis orders Anderson, you can't leave him in Pensacola after all this, of course, so Davis orders him to Joe Johnson's army at Manassas, and he's given command of a South Carolina brigade in James Longstreet's division, his old classmate from West Point. The army is soon transferred to the peninsula, and Anderson is and his brigade helped defend Yorktown until the Confederates evacuate and head up the peninsula toward Richmond with the Federals in hot pursuit. Now on May 4th, Johnson orders the troops occupying the fortifications east of Williamsburg to move out. We were there on a tour this last year. He leaves two divisions of the army with Longstreet to cover the rear guard. He's got all of his artillery and his wagon trains because the Federals are in hot pursuit. And Joe Johnson rides off. That evening, Longstreet orders Anderson to take two brigades and go back and man the fortifications. He orders his second division, now commanded by Daniel Harvey Hill, to continue retreating. And he tells his remaining four brigades to be ready to retreat at dawn. So the Army commander is left the guy he put in charge has got half his troops are gone and he's getting ready to move out. And Anderson is left with two brigades. Torrential rains fall that night. It is completely black. Anderson had no knowledge of these fortifications. 
He wasn't given a guide. He wasn't even given a map. He just told to go back and man the line. Well, they could find Fort Magruder here. It was on the road coming out of Williamsburg. That was an easy, and it was big. It was the biggest one, and it was on the road. So his South Carolinians occupied Fort Magruder and secured the left flank heading up towards Battery 11. Now, Lunette 7, you could see from Fort Magruder, even in the, in the dark in the rain, so they occupied it. And the troops heading to guard the left managed to spot the redoubts 9 and 11. Now they occupied 9, but Jeb Stewart's cavalry already occupied 11. Unseen in the darkness was Lunette 8, and we're all off to the left here, Lunette 8, and Redoubt 10. Out of sight, no troops. His second brigade occupied the five redoubts to the Confederate right. At 6 a.m. on May the 5th, the Federals opened fire on Anderson's pickets. And they're driven back and then Union artillery deploy and begin bombarding Fort Magruder. The federal guns were, had, there were more of them and they had a longer range. And so they're literally just shelling Fort Magruder and Anderson can't do anything about it. They're out of they hit the range of his guns. So he can't retreat. He's got to cover the, the wagon train. So what do you do? Anderson chooses to attack. For six hours, Anderson is going to maneuver, trying to get around the Union left flank in here, from Fort Magruder. He, they keep, he's stretching his line out as he gets more troops, keeps extending the line. While he is in take, has left Fort Magruder to take command of the right here, he, Stewart is left in command of the left. As Longstreet hears that the Yankees are attacking in, in force and about to overrun his rear guard, he begins telling the, the brigades that he had going north to head south. And they come back one at a time. And as they come back, Stewart assesses the situation along the line and sends them off to Anderson. By noon, the Confederates had managed to silence the enemy guns. Let me, let me go back. Let me jump back. Let me. Uh, 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 yeah, you're too fast. Too fast. <laughs> By noon, the Confederates had silenced the enemy guns, and they charged. They captured the cannon, and they drove the Federals from the field. Stewart had neglected the Confederate left, however, and shortly after Longstreet, who now comes back himself because it's really getting out of hand, learns that the Federals had captured Redoubt 11 and was rolling up his flank. All that Anderson had gained on the right was about to be lost, through no fault of his own. But finally, a brigade from Hill's division that had started retreat, uh, marching off the night before makes it back and saves the day. Joe Johnston and Longstreet declare Williamsburg a great Confederate victory. Word's going to get out of news, in, in northern newspapers that will reach President Davis in the war, Confederate War Department that it was not exactly the way Johnston and Longstreet claimed it, it was fought. But in any case, Longstreet says that Anderson's, quote, disposition of his forces and manner of leading them into action displayed great ability and signal gallantry and coolness. Anderson had saved the wagons and the artillery and the reputations of Joe Johnston and Longstreet. Now, historians have taken a harsher view of Anderson's performance. This is how you can get, be misled, if you will. Douglas Freeman concluded, quote, Anderson, perhaps not altogether careful in reconnaissance, but steady and capable of handling more than one brigade with none of a be beginner's uncertainty. Possibly a bit negligent in watching small details. Stephen Woodworth wrote, 
Anderson is the enigma of the battle. Criticizing him for apparently disappearing in the middle of the engagement, Woodward concluded Anderson had shown the darker side of his generalship. Carol Dubbs, who wrote A History of the Battle, best, best one in the history of the battle, had only one criticism to make. Anderson should have been better acquainted with the field and adequately garrisoned the far left redoubts to defend that flank. Well, you know historians, they get to write something. Anderson had no reason to think that his left flank was not secure because Stewart's, Stewart's, Jeb Stewart's troopers were holding Redoubt 11. And after Anderson left Fort Magruder to go to the, the Confederate right, Stewart is in command of the Confederate left. Stewart later reported, official report, quote, he frequently found it necessary to take the responsibility of dispatching reinforcements of artillery as well as infantry to points obviously requiring them. He, not Anderson, was in a better position to know if troops were needed on the left or not. And apparently he thought not because he didn't send any there. Now, as for Anderson's disappearance, indicated by Steve Woodworth, Colonel Porter Alexander stated that Anderson, quote, in person, had supervised all the movements of the morning. According to eyewitnesses at 1 p.m., when Anderson's not even there and has disappeared. Anderson is riding behind the 7th Alabama, 9th, I'm sorry, 9th Alabama in the final Confederate attack. It's going to capture the cannons and drive the Federals from the field. Everybody else saw where he was. Death continued to plague Anderson. His youngest child, had died July 4th, 1861. And his favorite brother was killed at Williamsburg while serving as his aide. Now, three weeks after the battle, remember that it's Anderson that saved the army. A.P. Hill, who was also in Longstreet's division, was promoted to Major General. Now this Anderson, I'm sorry, Longstreet had six brigades. This is an order of seniority. Anderson was the senior, which is why he got left behind on May the 5th. And they go Wilcox, Colson, Pickett, and then Hill, and finally Roger Pryor, a political general. This was a slap in the face to all two, Anderson, Wilcox, Colson, and Pickett. It didn't upset Anderson at all. But it did Wilcox in particular. When the fighting ended at Seven Pines on June 1st, 1862, no one questioned who the best brigadier was. Anderson had led two brigades in support of D.H. Hill's division and emerged with the sobriquet Fighting Dick. Anderson, who hated paperwork, made no report of the battle. He later claimed that Longstreet would handle it for the division. He was commanding his own and another brigade of, of Anderson, of, excuse me, of Longstreet's division. So Longstreet's gonna take care of it for the division. And Colonel Micah Jenkins, who commanded Anderson's brigade while he was commanding the two brigade, Demi division, if you will, would handle the report for the brigade. That's the way you get out of doing paperwork. It is also the way you get out of having anybody say anything about what you did during the battle. Nonetheless, Anderson was praised by D.H. Hill at Longstreet and Joe Johnston for his performance at Seven Pines. In his biography, R.E. Lee, Freeman concluded that Anderson had become, quote, the most brilliant, but at that time the most erratic of Longstreet's brigadiers. Now, less than a decade later, when Freeman wrote Lee's Lieutenants, he describes Anderson, quote, no performance on the field had been more difficult or more admirably executed. Now, this map is an example of how Anderson continues to be maligned. And I had to fight with some of my colleagues about the use of that word. Maligned is pretty strong. 
Well, the hero of this battle is fighting Dick Anderson. He's not there. He's not on the map. 80% of the troops he commanded, they're not on the map either. What did he do? It made him the hero of the battle. Now, in 1993, the history of the battle was written by Stephen Newton. He writes that Anderson commanded all six of Longstreet's brigades. Five years later, he wrote another edition where he corrects him the earlier mistake and details that Anderson's, I'm sorry, excuse me, that Longstreet's division was broken into three parts. Anderson had two brigades, Wilcox had three, and Pickett is on his own. You notice down here, Wilcox's brigade with Pryor there, and they're being driven from the field. Well, Anderson's not there. These divisions, uh, these brigades were commanded by Wilcox. So this time they remember to get his name on the map. He's just not there and he's not the one being driven from the field. There are several other errors with this map and truly there are so many mistakes that have been made about the Battle of Seven Pines that I really can't detail how Anderson got his nickname. The only troops shown on either of these maps were two regiments that he had detached under Colonel Jenkins. Where are Anderson and the rest of his units? In, 18, in the 1880s, this map shows Anderson and Jenkins brigades, but they are the same. Anderson moved up to command two brigades, so Jenkins as senior colonel takes over his brigade. So they get double representation on this map. His second brigade under Kemper doesn't make it on this map. It does not appear on any map that's ever been done of this battlefield that I can find. The Confederate brigade in the middle of the engagement that helped Anderson earn his nickname appears nowhere. Fighting Dick commanded Longstreet's division at Gaines Mill, all six brigades. He's not there. And three of the six brigades are not there. Now, it is at this battle where John Bell Hood becomes famous for cracking the Union line. Did it with two regiments, the 4th Texas and a few guys from the 18th Georgia, because not many of the Georgians kept up. Two regiments. But there was a second line. And that required Hood's entire brigade and also Whiting's brigade being under the command of Colonel Law. Law's brigade and Whiting do not appear on this map. But that only got him to the, through the second line. Whiting gets to the crest and there's a third line. This is the one that's got the cannon on it. And he realizes his two shot up brigades cannot punch their way through. So he calls upon the ranking officer in the area for help. Fighting Dick Anderson. And Anderson responded quickly. He moves two regiments up on Hood's right. Pickett moves up on their right. And he's le Anderson leads them forward and he breaks through the front. Meanwhile, his remaining three South Carolina regiments turn the flank of the Union Army down here and Wilcox and Pryor's brigades will join in the attack. In the end there are six brigades all under Anderson who break the final line and drive the Federals from the field. Anderson's not there. Three of the brigades are not there. The flanking movement by the half of Anderson South Carolina Brigade is not there. Now in 2012 Texas erected a monument describing the Confederate breakthrough. The monument tells the same story as the map. Anderson and the South Carolinians had nothing to do with it. The brigades of Pickett, Wilcox, and Pryor are also absent from the monument. Anderson remains in command of Longstreet's division three days later. Now all six of the brigades appear on this map in here. But not Anderson. It, 
Longstreet was in command of both his own and A.P. Hill's division. Anderson, who was in command of Longstreet's division, who actually, after Hill's division failed to break through, cracked the Union line, it was Anderson. Now, fortunately for the South Carolinian, Lee was neither a map maker nor a historian. He recognized Anderson's ability. Lee had taken command of the army on June 1st. Six days later, he wrote President Davis that he wanted Anderson promoted to Major General. He wrote Davis again on June the 25th. Davis visited Lee on the battlefield in Glendale. And then the, 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 watching the battle, Anderson's men were breaking the Union lines. Lee asked Davis for a third time to promote Anderson. He prodded Davis for a fourth time on July 11th. Remember all those rumors you hear about that Lee, Davis got every, gave Lee everything he asked for? Four times he asked the president for this. Finally, Lee finds out that Benjamin Yuji has been relieved of command of his division on July 14th. And Lee then writes the Secretary of War and asks for Anderson's promotion. And Davis finally promotes him that same day. Now, to celebrate his promotion to Major General, Anderson goes to Richmond, buys himself a new Major General's uniform, and has his photograph taken. The only one of him in a Confederate uniform, and I got to spend some time at, his, the, at the family plantation. They have one that I'd never seen before of him as a captain in the U.S. Army. Two photographs in his life. Anderson was the last division to leave Richmond for the second Manassas campaign in August. And on the way, Anderson's men capture a bunch of Yankees. And among the prisoners is a woman dressed in a soldier's uniform. Something that is not covered in the rules of war. So what do you do? Well, Anderson was a gentleman. He sent the woman back to the Federals under a flag of truce. However, in doing so, it let the Federals know that his division wasn't still back in Richmond, which Lee wanted them to think. That was one of his first two mistakes he would make with Lee. The other one was a paperwork mistake that wasn't his fault. But he, Anderson, in letting the woman go, let the enemy know where his division was. Lee was upset. Now, Second Manassas. This is nice to say this in front of a Union officer. I mean a Union audience, excuse me. So even though Lee held none of his subordinates responsible for Polk managing to escape at Second Manassas, historians have concluded it was impossible for the Federals to have saved themselves. Some Confederate messed up. They needed a scapegoat. Goat. Truly, think about that. The Federals were not capable of saving themselves. In 1993, John Hennessy concluded that two brigadiers, two colonels, and especially Anderson, could have done better. In 2008, Joseph Gladhauer blamed only Anderson. Again, either the historians have been unduly critical, or Anderson hoodwinked Lee. Lee rewarded Anderson's performance in Second Manassas by increasing his division to six brigades. He'd only had three before. And it, met, and it became the strongest in the army. A.P. Hill also had six brigades, but Anderson's had a, contained more numbers. So the fellow who was responsible for Pope getting away, Lee rewards following the battle. At Sharpsburg, Anderson is severely wounded in the thigh before he could deploy his men. He really he didn't have a chance to do anything. And in part, his being wounded and having to leave the field led to the debacle in the sunken road. On the extreme left, at Fredericksburg, in December of 62, his men saw little action. But then comes Chancellorsville. When Lee learned that Hooker had crossed the Rapidan River, and he ordered Anderson to meet the threat. Anderson rushes to Chancellorsville. 
By sunrise on April the 30th, he has three brigades deployed in line. And he learns that four Union Corps are descending upon him. Anderson pulls back. And at the intersection of the Orange Plank, boop, boop, excuse me, Orange Plank and the Turnpike here, he finds Lee's engineer officer waiting with orders from General Lee. Anderson's men are supposed to construct a line of fortifications guarding the intersection. This is the first time that Lee will ever have his infantry in trench on the eve of a battle. Anderson is facing certain annihilation. Four Corps, that for some of our less knowledgeable ones, a Corps would have, I'd say, I'll say it at 10 brigades, 8 brigades at a Union Corps at that time. So it was 30, 32 to 3, if you will. Somebody asked Anderson, what are you going to do? Anderson responds, fight. General Lee says so. But fighting Joe Hooker declined. And when he crept forward on May 1st, five Confederate divisions counterattacked. And after five days of hard fighting, Hooker is driven across the river. Lee reported that, quote, Anderson was distinguished for the promptness, courage, and skill which he and his division executed every order. Giving Anderson credit for coming up with Wright's flanking movement on May the 1st, Freeman concluded, always it was Anderson's nature to take the largest blame and the least praise. At Chancellorsville, as previously, he merited far more than ever he would have thought of claiming. That's why you don't get remembered and nobody knows anything about you. Ignoring Anderson altogether, Gary Gallagher described Wright's movement as spectacularly successful. Didn't matter that it was done under Anderson's guidance. That was May the 1st. On May the 4th, Joseph Gladhire wrote, Sensing an opportunity to crush Sedwick's command, Lee rushed Anderson's division over to collaborate with the two veteran commanders. This time, however, Early struck aggressively, Anderson half-heartedly, and McLaws barely budged. Okay. Gladhauer implies that Anderson was the novice of the three. Yet Anderson had more years of service in the old army than Early, outranked him by more than six months as a major general, and had commanded multiple brigades in five battles to Early's two. Now, regarding Anderson's performance on May the 4th, Lee wrote McLaws that night. So what, what you just, so you have the Confederates are gonna push him back, gonna try to cut him off from the fort. So you have McLaws, you have Anderson, and you have Early. Now, who should push the least? Anderson, because you, you, you don't want to push him back and make them, you know, the, the farther they go back, the more likely they are to escape and also the stronger their, their, their position. But no matter, Lee wrote McLaws that night. Generals Anderson and Early drove the enemy handsomely from the positions. Well, it doesn't seem that Lee had a problem with what Anderson did. On May 20th, he wrote President Davis regarding the promotion or recommending the promotion of Richard Ewell and A.P. Hill to replace the fallen Stonewall Jackson. He adds, this is Lee to Davis, R.H. Anderson and J.B. Hood are also capital, capital, capital excuse me, officers. They are improving too and will make good corps commanders if necessary. Note, Lee doesn't mention Early or McLaws. Now, Anderson, in my opinion, his worst performance, by far, it may be the only, no, he had, a, he had another one that slips in my mind now, but his worst day of the war comes at, on, at Gettysburg on July the 2nd. The successful Confederate attack that started on the right with Hood and then McLaws and rolling up the Union left flank bogs down when Mahone's brigade fails to advance, which Mahone had been ordered to do. Neither Anderson 
Mahone's division commander, nor A.P. Hill, Mahone's corps commander, got Mahone to advance. With so many to blame, historians who are quick to blame Anderson on every other battlefield fail to criticize his performance at Gettysburg. Go figure. Makes no sense. But there he should have, something was off with, with a lot more than Anderson. In any case, May 6, 1864, a volley from a Hones Brigade, those same dastardly con Confederates, severely wounds Longstreet, their corps commander, shoots their commander. The following day, Lee made Anderson temporary commander of the First Corps in orders. Now, this is this is somebody made the hint earlier about um, Lee did rather well at Spotsylvania, and 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 this is why, and this is this is where historians are really doing wrong. Lee's first order to Anderson, after putting him in command of Longstreet's form, First Corps, as soon after dark as you can effect it. Withdraw Longstreet's corps from the lines as quietly as possible. When you have done this, march the troops a little way to the rear and let them have some sleep. At three o'clock punctually, march towards Spotsylvania Courthouse. Okay, you're going to pull them out at 11, you're going to let them rest, and at three o'clock in the morning, you're going to take off. About dark, William Pendleton, Lee's chief of artillery, arrives in Anderson's headquarters and he has the guide who's going to get Anderson to Spotsylvania. And the guide tells Anderson the condition of the road he's going to march on. <coughs> After he learns the condition of the road, Anderson determines that he'll rest his men at the end of the march. And he so informs Pendleton, who reported, quote, here a circumstance occurred which should be specially noticed. General Anderson stated that his orders were to march by 3 next morning. He was preparing to start at 11 that night. Those four hours anticipated proved of incalculable value next day. The myth that Anderson only marched that far because he could not find a suitable place for his men to rest sooner is based on two private letters written by Anderson, the self-effacing Anderson, long after the war. Freeman writes, the modesty of Anderson's nature kept him from asserting anything more concerning his march to Spotsylvania than that. After starting, he kept moving because he did not find a suitable place at which to rest. This may have been the literal fact but behind it was the soldierly spirit, which applies almost instinctively this sound principle. When on the march, the best insurance against the accidents of the road is an early start. I'm glad I took three days last month to get to Vicksburg. William Hassler concluded that by this, quote, brilliant performance, Anderson had earned his promotion within 24 hours of receiving it. Most historians still credit the Burning Woods for saving Lee and his army at Spotsylvania. Something that Freeman omitted, and most people would probably question, is Lee offered Anderson command of the Confederate Cavalry Corps after Stuart's death. Lee allowed Anderson to decline to, to take it. There are two reasons for this and there is the debate about exactly it happens in May. Either Lee wanted to do it because he wanted to put early in command of a, of a corps after he'll return to duty from sick leave or he didn't really want to take on managing all three cavalry divisions on his own. But because it's impossible to pin down exactly the day he does it in May, can't say for sure which way. It's going to be remedied because when one for one reason Ewell will be relieved and Early will have the second corps because of that. Now, 
cartographers continue to portray their own version of events as well. Some of you may have received this map last month. It depicts the May 23rd fighting along the North Anna River. Longstreet had been gone for 17 days, yet here he is commanding the First Corps, rather than Anderson. On May 30th, Lee determined to attack with Ewell's Corps, now commanded by Early, supported by Anderson. Anderson was to occupy the fortifications that Early vacated, and if possible, even support Early's attack. So as Early pulls his men out of the trenches and moves to the right, Anderson stretches his men out. And he occupies Early's section of the line. He even leaves a gap in his own line in order to send Pickett's division to join the attack. Now Pickett's assault fails because it didn't give Early the aid he needed. And this results in a confrontation between Early and Anderson. That night, Anderson sent Early a message. Quote, General Field reports having come upon an entrenched line of the enemy, and owing to that circumstance and the approach of darkness, I have suspended his movement and have drawn my whole line back to the left again so as to connect with General Breckinridge, between whom and the left of my line a very wide gap had been made. The attack failed because Early used two brigades instead of three divisions. But Early blamed Anderson. Quote, I met with no cooperation from your force except the artillery, which opened on my request. I could find neither General Pickett nor yourself on the line. Early reports to Lee that because Anderson left him unsupported, he could do nothing but withdraw. This is the only time that the ever forgiving and unflappable Anderson lost it that I found. He shoots back to Early, and no doubt this surprised Early. Quote, if you mean by cooperation committing equal folly with yourself, I grant that I did not cooperate. <laughs> but if you mean that I did not proceed to carry out the instructions of General Lee, your statement is false. Your opinion as to the best point for attacking the enemy and the, matter, and the manner of conducting the attack is very obligingly given. I have not, however, a high appreciation of your judgment and I decline to be guided by it. Anderson ended this by telling Early that if he had another cooperative movement to propose in the future, communicate it to the commanding general instead of me. Now the only reason we know about this is because when Early's baggage wagon is overrun in March of 1865, federal soldiers captured this and it's published in northern newspapers. Gordon Ray contends, contends over about this interchange between Early and Anderson, quote, Anderson's half-hearted showing on May 30th poisoned his future relations with Early and raised serious questions about his fitness for corps command. I think very highly of Gordon Ray, but in this case he's only correct as it applies to Early and Early's unwillingness to cooperate with Anderson later on. Now, I don't know how, we, I guess we, I don't have to make the sign, do I? Here we go. Anderson arrives at first deep bottom. Now this, this, this battle, one of the, you know, nobody's there that's anybody unless you count Sheridan and Hancock. But on the Confederate side, so it doesn't get a lot of coverage. But anyway, the first battle of deep bottom. Hancock and Sheridan have crossed the James. They're trying to distract Lee and make him shift troops north of the James to weaken the line at Petersburg before the crater is exploded. And it has some success. By the time Anderson gets there, he's outnumbered more than five to one. And many of the guys, five plus soldiers, are armed with repeating rifles. His men are nearly surrounded. 
Confederate Brigadier General James Connor wrote his wife about Anderson's performance that day. It is the first time I ever was under Anderson. And he is a regular Trump. Cool as an icebox. Calm and serene when the enemy were all around us. And the fight going on seemingly around the circle. I never saw anyone less excitable. I was charmed. Just what did Anderson do? He spotted Hancock and Sheridan on a hill observing the battle and he rides rode out in front of the Confederate lines between the two armies that were that was in, heavily engaged and he gave them the finger <laughs> then he attacked remember outnumbered more than five to one he attacks he saves his command and he won a grand tactical success it's, it's always written off it was a Confederate defeat Confederates lost more troops and Lee did wind up shifting more, like the other brigade, shifting more troops over across the James. It wasn't enough to allow the crater to be a success. But on the, 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 you know, the, the basic tactical level, Federals won. On the grand strategic level, the Federals won. But the part in between is where Anderson blocked a force more than five times his size. In early June, Early was detached with the Second Corps to the Shenandoah Valley. He's reinforced there in, with, by Anderson in August. Now, Early's unwillingness to cooperate with Anderson nearly resulted in Anderson's command b being destroyed at Charlestown, and eventually it led to Anderson's departure from the valley. And on September the 4th, Anderson and his infantry marching east from Winchester. Now that same day, Sheridan manages to move 40,000 infantry without early having any idea of what's going on. So you have the 8th Corps, another Corps here, and one up here. And here's An Anderson coming from, from uh, Winchester. And, it's, and one of the things that's interesting about this, now this map is a Confederate map, but it, it appears if you, Anderson's men, and by the, if you will, compare the red to the blue, that there are many reds as there are blues here. Lacking any cavalry, Anderson has 4,000 infantry and they run head on into the 8th Corps, 15,000 strong. They're four miles west of Berryville and it's an hour before sunset. You're on the road, got no cavalry, 4,000 to 15,000. Federals are up on the high ground behind stone walls. What are you going to do? One of Anderson's staff officers recalled, quote, it was at this time that the whole command could have been gobbled up and General Anderson reached the conclusion that nothing but audacity would save us. While his infantry deployed in a line of battle and his cannon deployed and began firing, Anderson brings up the wagon train, puts them all in the front line. Federals are firing at him from the high ground behind the stone wall. Anderson orders the charge. A Union regiment broke, and a second regiment broke, and probably at least two more broke. Pretty soon, instead of outflanking Anderson with their superior numbers, which is what they should have done, the 2nd Union Division on the field had to reinforce the 1st Division just to hold the high ground. T. Harry Williams wrote about this battle because Weatherford B. Hayes was there. Williams wrote, quote, the impromptu little battle had been a real slugging match, fought by both sides with lethal tenacity. Much of it in darkness, with friend indistinguishable from foe. In the end, the Federals fled, left Anderson in possession of the high ground. Again, 4,000, surprise, outnumbered 15,000, high ground. Un you know, unbelievable, you attack. A lot, of, a lot of Stonewall Jackson there, I think. 
On October 19th, well anyway, Anderson goes back, eventually Lee gets out of the valley, gets back to Richmond. Longstreet comes back, recovers from his wound, and on October 19th takes over command of the First Corps. Lee wants to retain Anderson as a lieutenant general. He still thinks Anderson's good. So he organizes a Fourth Corps out of Beauregard's old command. And Anderson will serve out the remainder of the war around Petersburg. Now for most of that time he will only have one actual division directly under his command because of other circumstances, nothing related to his behavior. But Lee keeps him on. Lee figures out a way to, to, to keep him as a lieutenant general. April the 2nd, the Confederate lines are broken around Petersburg. Confederates begin their retreat. And during this retreat, Anderson, in addition to his division of Bushrod Johnson, he also winds up with Pickett's division, left over primarily from the Battle of Five Forks. Now, as they're retreating, on April the 6th, a gap opens up in the, the line. Longstreet is out in front, and then it's Anderson, and then it's Ewell, and then it's Gordon. A gap opens up. Longstreet, he didn't, man, he didn't stop and guard anything. He just headed off. And Mahone's division, same, same, that same fella, people only remember him for the great battle at the crater. Not all the other things that he, he and his men did wrong. But anyway, Mahone is part of Longstreet's command at this time, but he had taken a wrong road earlier and is behind. So he gets an order from Lee personally to move up, skip past the wagons and the artillery and come on and join Longstreet. So Mahone interrupts his breakfast with Pickett along Little Sailor's Creek, gets his men moving, and so so they had found the road. Okay, so they so Mahone is on the east bank, not having breakfast with Pickett, and he gets the word, so he gets his troops moving, and at this intersection, he runs into Robert E. Lee. And Lee says, Lee requested, you don't have Lee in any request, he requested Mahone to detach a brigade to guard this road. Longstreet had passed it by and left nobody here. And it was safe enough at the time. Lee requests Mahone to leave a brigade. Now, I guess you can cut Mahone a little bit of slack because he wasn't a professional soldier. The, the, the rule book said he, you would leave your senior brigadier general. Didn't matter if his brigade was the biggest or the smallest, your senior subordinate is the one who gets this assignment, the independent assignment. Well, he didn't pick that fellow who happened in this, case, this day to command the second largest brigade. And he didn't pick his largest. Instead, Mahone leaves half of the second weakest brigade. Could have left a thousand men. Instead, he leaves 250. So, Lee and Mahone march on off. He leaves Brevard and 250 Floridians here. And the Union cavalry attack Anderson at this intersection. Now Anderson has to hold this intersection because Ewell and Gordon and the wagon train farther down the road. Anderson can't come on unless he wants to abandon Ewell and Gordon. So Crook and his cavalry have Anderson pinned down here. Meanwhile Custer's going on ahead and he gets a brigade across Little Sailor's Creek they surprise and capture almost all of the Floridians and move up and block the Confederate line of retreat. They're in here. The other second brigade comes up and they're block they're guarding the the reverse. So there's one brigade facing Anderson's men. When Pickett, whose men were closest to the creek, find out what has happened, he rushes the brigade across and then follows it with the rest of his division. And they drive Custer's one brigade back half a mile and they open up the road. At about 2 p.m., Anderson manages to send off two brigades of Johnson's division. But as they're crossing the creek, more Union cavalry arrive. And they block the road again. Now, finally, Ewell 
has reached the intersection and Gordon is closed up. So Anderson takes the remaining in two brigades of Johnston and comes across the creek. He's going to clear the way. Well, he can't. Ewell, who is the senior officer, learns that their route's blocked. So he leaves Hope's Corner and crosses the creek to confer with Anderson. So he asks Anderson, well, what should we do? And Anderson says, well, we're either going to unite and fight our way through or we should retreat off into the woods to the northwest. And you'll say, well, what do you think? And Anderson said, let's fight. And you'll agree. So you'll shift his line around and the Confederates are going to form a line about like this. They're going to have the, the mule shoe here. And they get it all set up and they're getting ready to attack and then word comes that the Federals have reached the rear of Ewell's line. Because Gordon, instead of following, because Ewell didn't get word to Gordon, apparently, as far as we know, instead of Gordon following on the road here, Gordon marches off down this road. So now the Federals are free to come down the road and get in Ewell's rear. So now it's, well, what are we going to do? And so what they decide is, they said, oh, look, I'll attack and try to clear the front. You go back and take care of the rear. Ewell says, okay. And then Ewell stays to watch Anderson's attack. And the Confederate attack fails. And so Ewell leaves going to the rear. And on the way, he's captured because he has, he has pulled a division out of line. And this little U pulled one out from right in the center and shifted it off to the left. And so then the Conf Union cavalry come in. And while he's going back to this line up here, they capture him. Then, Union cavalry break through the Confederate line under Anderson, Pickett, and Johnson. Pickett's men flee from the field. Johnson's men follow, and Ewell is cut off. And so there's the great capture of Ewell and Custis Lee, and maybe 20% of Lee's army. Anderson and most of his men are going to get away, and they're going to wind up fleeing to the, off to the northwest through the woods. Responsibility for this disaster at Little Sailor's Creek rested with Lee and Mahone and Ewell. Two days later, April the 8th, 1865, the day before the surrender, Lee relieves Anderson, I'm sorry, Anderson, Pickett, and Bushrod Johnson from duty. Everyone has assumed that Lee was leave these three people because they were the three people who escaped Little Sailor's Creek. That's what they, the, literally what the three of them had in common. Holding Lee blameless for what happened there, Freeman eventually makes Anderson the scapegoat. Emory Thomas in his biography of Lee, however, and it's also worth noting Emory was married to an FFV. So he couldn't, you know, he had to really watch what he said bad about Barbara D. Lee. It, it, you know, you, you, and he did a biography of Stewart and others, but, but you know, you have to watch it. You know, if you if you're a part of that society, and I, Emory only married into it, but you know, if he wanted to stay there and be welcome, he had to watch it. He writes this trio. Anderson, Pickett, and Bushrod Johnson felt Lee's wrath and Lee's righteousness endure it to the end of his tenure in command. Now the truth is Johnson was relieved because he lost his troops after they fled from Little Sailor's Creek. Pickett was relieved for five forks after Lee learned more about what had really happened. And Anderson was relieved because he outranked John Brown Gordon. Had Ewell not been captured, he would have been relieved along with Anderson because Lee had already made up his mind on by April 4th or 5th that he's going to combine his, reorganize his army into two corps. He wanted Longstreet and Gordon to command those two corps. And if that's one reason, for example, the third corps with people like Harry Heath gets put in with Longstreet, Harry Heath outranks. John Brown Gordon. Now, I hope I made the case that Anderson has been maligned. At least, in, I think Robert E. Lee would agree with me. 
This is the most famous print ever done of Confederate general officers. Robert E. Lee. We got, I mean, there are, every, all, everybody who's anybody and a few that were nobodies are here. <laughs> we have Lee, we have Lee, we have John Brown Gordon, Albert Sidney Johnson, John Bell Hood over here. This little fella right there. Supposedly, the name at the bottom says it's Richard Anderson. But it's not. That is the head of Joseph Reed Anderson of Tredegar Iron Works. And I must confess, when our book came out and that, when that was wound up being on the cover, I did not catch it. The, bio, the second biographer of Anderson explained it to me. And it's like, you know, it's, what, do you mean, what do you mean he's, it's, he's not there? And he's not. Can you imagine? Now, part of it, one justification would be the artist, you know, it was in Richmond. There was only one photograph of Anderson any, that had ever been taken. Now, there were there are multiple prints, but not very many of them. Uh, he he didn't get one, so either he figured it was the same, you know the same Anderson, or he used what he could, and also it didn't hurt because Joseph Reed Anderson is prominent in, in Richmond, and that's you know where the painting would hang. It worked. Now, Terry Williams had demonstrated in his writings that a great battle captain in the Civil War had to be willing to fight. Had to be willing to fight. What general on either side could claim to have fought more aggressively and more successfully than fighting Dick Anderson? He wasn't Lee, he wasn't Jackson. But how many generals in the Army of Northern Virginia should be ranked ahead of him? Less than a handful, if you only ask this historian. I thank you. Before y'all buy me out of books, I would welcome any questions. Yes, sir. Heading forth, heading forth. I, I'm, uh, I would, uh, in terms of the six, I would, I would rank him a close third. He's, he definitely is ahead of Early. Uh, Early has, has gotten off. One, one, one. I just throw something out for speculation. Don't quote me too far about this, but. Gary Gallagher worked on a biography of Jubal Early for, for literally for decades and finally gave it up. Now, you all, some of you may be familiar with Grady McQuinney, who worked on a biography of Bragg for decades and published one volume and, and gave it up. I, I have to wonder if maybe Gary found things he didn't want to say about Early. I don't know. But Anderson, like I said, when I, 10 years ago, I would have said that, that Anderson was worse than Ewell and, and A.P. Hill. So I've come a long way, but 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 if but if we take Ed's word for it that that Anderson was better than those two, I can make the case that he's better than than, than Early. And the second question is, what did you have to go through to find the evidence that you needed to explain what Anderson was doing? Because it seems like it's pretty clear that he was doing things that were as opposed to what other people said. Well, it's I well when, when truly when I got back from from Virginia after talking with Ed, I went to work and literally I when I finished running things down, I had eighty three thousand words, and I had a couple unanswered questions, and I still have one one very big question, which is what really happened at Seven Pines? I mean it it I mean it elevated him and Lee's idol, he was the one Lee wanted. He, he, was, he, he was, you know, the first new major general of infantry in his army. He wanted it, and he pushed, and he pushed, and he pushed till he got it. The internet is one thing that has helped. The more and more newspaper accounts, and records from the National Archives. He, Anderson had, you know, a couple, of, like I mentioned, the one about the, the battle with the abolitionists. Well, you can find at least ten different versions of what happened there and who instigated the battle and who Anderson fought. Most of the accounts 
in northern newspapers said they were fighting pro pro slavery people. Uh, it was not. I didn't realize that apparently it was like so politically unpopular, but nobody wanted to let it out that the United States government had attacked abolitionists. Uh, this is 1857 in, in, in Bleeding, Kansas. Uh, he Anderson got you know there's he got, he gets involved he gets involved he's he's like second in command of a post and his in the post commander gets killed murdered by the the post surgeon. It's going to lead to a national incident. Uh, of, of legal precedent and if, as an example if Anderson wound up letting the surgeon end up in civilian hands and they find him innocent at first they don't even press charges but then eventually they're gonna they're gonna try and find him innocent so if you're f if you commit a crime on a military post killing your se your superior officer and a civilian court finds you innocent can the military still bring you before court-martial they never tried it, but Anderson became the scapegoat for even making the possi making it a possibility. Uh, I spent uh, some time with the family. His his home still stands. In fact, it is a national landmark because it is made out of what's called packed earth. It is a tech building technique in the Middle East that his father used. There are only 10 buildings like it in the United States. Seven of them are on his plantation. Two of them are across the street at the church. And, I, and the 10th the, the one is somewhere else. So and it has nothing to do with the people who died there or lived there or, or and even Anderson had, because of the architecture. Uh, the, one of the rare things was, this is a good one. So you know, you can't talk about a woman being pregnant in, in, in 1861. And there was, a, uh, there was a scandal about why did it take Dick Anderson so long to resign from the Army. And he would have waited longer, except he had to allow so much time for it to be accepted before Lincoln became president. And that's why it was the February the 15th, the, 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 a, a, a paperwork technicality. So the wife has the baby, they make the trip, that, that baby's the one that's going to die July the 4th. There was no record because it's, you know, after the census, there's no, absolutely no record of this third child, birth or death. But I knew that that was, there's a, there a little piece in a South Carolina newspaper saying Mrs. Anderson's condition required him, Captain Anderson to delay his resignation. Well, she, so she's pregnant. Well, what happened to the baby? Because the baby's not there in 1870. Well, I found, the, I found the baby's grave, which is across the street from the family home. And unless they were funning with me, none of the family had ever discovered it. Because she was off by herself, uh, at least the way, well, not by herself, but it was not uh, surrounded by family members. Her name was Mackenzie. And the really funny part is that the, the family still have owned the, the, the house continuously. There are currently it says three brothers and a sister. The sister's name Mackenzie, and she had no idea, no idea that she's named for the for the infant who died in 1861. So a part of it is 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 the internet makes things easier. There's more out there, uh, but but really it, it just going. You really it's, I'm, 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 I mean I was bewildered how much is wrong. I mean it literally does. If you look at what even, I mean, it's like, you know, Freeman, who was like the most prominent in the first real historian, look at these, uh, Lee and his, his general, he, he was, at, he, he might have at least been fair, because let's say he also had access to less information uh, than, than some of these more modern historians. I mean, it's like people have gone out of their way. Uh, and, and also, it's, it's sort of like, and I've asked a couple of people about it, about supposedly, you know, I find it hard to believe that someone with Jackson never lied. But I know George Rabel studied him for a decade, and that's what he said. Now, Anderson, I, I will say, lied once. Now, that's, this, I mean, to me, this is phenomenal, but, but it basically, if you, can, if, you, if you look, if you run down every story and everything, and you will say, well, well, that, well Anna, you know, it was like, not like he said, it was the way Anderson said, et cetera, et cetera. The brother who's, who shot at Williamsburg, while serving as his aide, gets hit in the head, and a big piece of the skull is blown out. I've managed to find where the, 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 
the, the body is taken to a doctor's house in Williamsburg and later that day he's uh, he's dead, the brother's dead, and they arranged for paying for the coffin and to have him buried. And at first I thought, well, this is why Anderson disappears from the battlefield, like Steve Woodward said. He, his brother's shot in the head and he's trying to, going to try and save him. He tells his father, now, I, don't, I see no reason for any, I don't think Anderson left the, the field. Well, I mean, people, E.P. E. Alexander says he didn't. But I don't see Anderson even getting his brother taken to a doctor in town unless he's if he's already dead but he writes his father saying that, that his brother was killed instantly to save his you know he didn't tell his father the truth in my opinion so that, you know I can understand why he lied and, and as far as I know that's the only one uh, but it is it is hard it is hard if you don't you know if you don't write your, you know it's in a sense it's you know I've never encountered it with anybody else if if you don't if you don't tell you if you don't toot your if you if you don't toot your own horn you don't have to lie even if you tell the truth and you did something wrong but if you don't say anything and nobody else is going to say anything you 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 literally are forgotten now there's a uh, on March 31st 1865 there's an engagement at the White Oak Road right before the, the evacuation of Petersburg and four Confederate I think it's four but well one well we'll say I'll just say three and a half. Three and a half Confederate, shot up Confederate brigades from different divisions that had never served together at all. They're going to attack and they're going to basically rout two Union divisions. More than twice their numbers. On March 31st, 1865, well, Robert E. Lee was on the field. And the br br brigade commanders were all kind of independent because they all came from a different division. Nobody wrote a report of it. This is March 31st, 1865. It's like Anderson wasn't there. So literally, if nobody says anything about Anderson, the historians have concluded that Anderson wasn't there. So in this, what started out to be a great Confederate victory, now eventually more Union troops are going to arrive and they're going to be way outnumbered and it's going to fall apart. But just that so they would pull it off, Anderson gets no credit because supposedly Anderson wasn't there because nobody ever mentioned it. And, and and if you consider from the standpoint, if you've served, in, if you've been in the service, you know, and you have the like the, the, the you know the colonel and the you know lieutenant colonel and the major and the captain and the lieutenant. If nobody mentioned the captain, it doesn't mean that some lieutenant carried out the colonel's orders just because he's not mentioned. It's like and it's like Anderson wasn't there. Anderson had nothing to do with it. Anderson, if not from the front, he led from behind the front line, and Anderson would fight. Sometimes and An you know Anderson Anderson was reckless. There's a, uh, I mentioned there, Anderson and Stonewall Jackson are, are very similar, and, and I think the best, the, what would be the closest example for Jackson is Cedar Mountain. Stonewall Jackson had the greater number. He attacked, almost lost the battle, and he kept, he kept fighting until he won, like, if you will, Grant at, Shy, at, at Shiloh. Anderson, was, Anderson would fight. Anderson, you know, he shouldn't have survived Berryville. He shouldn't have survived Williamsburg. Uh, on the flip side, he sh I, well, at least, but Mahone shouldn't survive Gettysburg, uh, and, and, and Anderson let him get away with it. But it it, it is hard, and like I said, I, I, I had to set it aside uh, to finish up a book of. I finally found a publisher for a book of portraits and Civil War photographs, but I want to get back to Anderson. But there there are some pieces uh, that, that particularly Seven Pines. It was it was. A long time to figure out what happened at Sailor's Creek. But there's a whole lot of people who don't want the truth coming. I mean, you know, at the time, nobody's going to tell. And the war's over. The war's over. Other questions? I took. Yes, sir. Well, Larry, uh, uh, while you were talking, uh, I'm wondering, in terms of the ranking, and I think in particular, uh, the ranking of early and Anderson and Richard's first and so it caused me to wonder, did Anderson have any part in promulgating the lost cause theory after the war? And if not, did that have something to do with ranking early ahead of uh, Anderson with a lot of people? And or and or one thing you want to Virginia? Uh you you made me when you, as you started that question, you made me think of something else. One of the one of the things, one of the funny one of the I don't even think it, I don't think I made the essay in this book because so much had to be cut out. 
May the, if I'm going to get it right, I think it's May the 18th, maybe it's May the 31st, whatever it is, someday in May of 1864, the Confederate Congress authorizes temporary lieutenant generals, provisional officers at various ranks. And Davis immediately promotes Early. At that time, Early is, is commanding the Second Corps, and is in the front. And Davis telegraphs Lee that he's done it. And Lee shoots back, well, you must do it for Anderson as well. Don't forget. So, because Anderson had started out as a temporary lieutenant general, at least serving as a corps commander before Early. And he was a, he, he was, yeah, he was senior to Early as a brigadier general as well. So, Davis fills out the paperwork that same day for Anderson, sends it over to Congress. Well, and something you know unbelievable happens in government. You know the early gets early gets pushed through May the thirty first. It pa the bill passes May the thirtieth. Davis pushes it. Early gets put through on the thirty first. Davis sends Anderson over on a separate piece of paper saying, "Okay, we want it to date to the same as Anderson." Well, Cong the Congress doesn't approve it till the next day. But it's but he he ranks to the same date as early, but. The pecking order of names on the promotion list is where the seniority is. Even if you and you know everybody becomes a colonel the same day, it's where you are on the list. I don't know if Lee knew at the time what happened, but it was Lee inten Lee's intention that Anderson would outrank Early. Early believed Early didn't know what had happened with the, with these promotions. Early believed that. Anderson did outrank him, and that's why Early did everything he could to stay away from him in the valley, because he didn't want to come under Anderson's command. And Lee kept assuring him, Anderson's not like that, don't worry about it. And Anderson never tried to take command. I don't know if Anderson knew, I, I, you know, everybody, e either they didn't know the truth, or if they did, they kept their mouth shut, like it, Lee, but Early, and as far as I know, all of them thought that Anderson was the ranking officer. So that was part of that. Now, after the war, Anderson, he winds up working as a laborer in a railroad yard. And somebody comes by and knocks on the, you know, goes to visit the president of the railroad company and said, you know who you got working out there? We, we, we can't have that. And so he gets, he gets promoted to what? A desk job. He hates paperwork. <laughs> he hates paperwork. And, and, and he winds up, he's, he's you know, he, you, you're not, if, you, if you hate it, you're not the best at doing it. And somebody manages to embezzle some money from the railroad company, and it was on his watch. He didn't steal any of it, but it was on his watch. And the company goes under, and he's, you know, kind of tainted for it. But he doesn't, he doesn't do anything during Reconstruction. He's, you know, he's just very quiet. He wants to make a living. One of the, you know, one of the, the things that, that, I, that I wish I could find more on is he writes, I want to say, it was either to his, one of his brothers or to Daniel Harvey Hill. He writes a letter in the spring of 1863 before Chancellorsville about education during the Civil War. Now you think about all, you know, Sherman burned all of Georgia and this, that, and the other. What happened to the schools in the South and the school teachers? And Anderson's worried about his, his, his he's got two, a, a son and a daughter who, who will make it to, uh, to maturity. They're not, they're not getting educated. They're not going to school. Uh, what about everybody? And, and, and like I said, his, his family is one of the richest in the South. What about the other people? And it's like he was looking at it, even, you know, even if we win the war and even if they survive, they're not going to be the generation that they could have been. And I think, you know, and, and I've, I've never run across anybody else that really looked at it, that issue, before. Like, he, he put it in this one letter. And so after the war, i, I got to cut it off. Okay. After the war, part of the problem is, you, you, you don't, you know, if you had a wife and two kids, you, you, and the kids would go off with this relative or that relative, whatever, you, you don't make a lot of money working in the railroad yard to support your kids. And that bothered them. That really bothered them. Well, can I have one more? If there's a one, y'all oh, come on. Okay, and then we're gonna. Oh, your his battery's dying. One, that's it. One, okay. Uh, what I was gonna ask you is, what did, what did you do after the <laughs> <laughs> Well, he sort of won the lottery. Literally a few months before he died, he gets 
appointed the phosphate agent for South Carolina. And he gets down, he gets the appointment, he moves, gets down, he gets the, 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 down to Beaumont, or I should, not, or is it Bu Buford? Yeah, it's Buford, Buford, South Carolina, yeah. And he's there about 10 weeks and he dies. And you know, he literally maybe got his first check, you know. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, that's, and, and so he, you know, if you will, he, he, and, he, and he sent some money to his daughter. And he was looking forward to having his daughter come live with him finally because he was, you know, he, he was in a position. So he's buried in a nice crypt there in the cemetery. Uh, Beaufort. 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 I would not have said Beaufort. Beaufort. 